we're going to get back started up again. Uh, so I'm going to switch the game plan around a little bit, lecture for you a little bit, while some people are still trying to install their um, operating system and their software. So let me show you what you need to install. If you're on a Windows, you're on a Mac, that's fantastic. If you're on a MacBook, you're in number one great shape. Objective-C programming and iOS programming can only be done on a MacBook. So if you don't have a Mac or a Mac computer, if you don't have a Mac computer like you don't have, You'll have to install VirtualBox with a Mac uh, virtual machine, which is what these guys are trying to do over here. I can't help you with that. It's uh, you know it's actually kind of a violation of the <laughs> of the OS X anyway operating system. But long story short, figure out how to do it. Talk to this group over here. They have it working, or part of them have it working, part of them don't. Um, there's also a white computer right there. If you're on the white computer, is white, did the white computer get connected? The white computer didn't get connected. If you're on a MacBook, <laughs> so I'm talking to people with MacBooks right now, or if you're inside of your virtual machine, which you have actually, we can make sure that you have Xcode installed. So if you're on a MacBook, update, there's actually just updated today, there's a new operating system update out to support iOS 7. Don't need it, but uh, there's uh, capabilities of it. You know what you want to do is go to the um, Apple Store by going into Software Update. And uh, look at that, there's an Xcode update. Um, and I can do that right now. It uh, looks like version 5, um, an error occurred. It probably didn't want to download it or something. Actually, my internet, oh, there it goes. It's 1.96. Uh, anyway, long story short, if you don't have Xcode installed, type in on the finder here Xcode. Type in Xcode, press return. And uh, if that white MacBook actually does ever start working, you can see it right here. And it says it's installing as the status because I'm installing this update. Xcode is the development package that we're using for this course. If you have a Ubuntu machine, you can get an Xcode version for Ubuntu. There's a third-party library that you can install to compile with Objective-C. Only problem is you can't do iOS development. It won't work for iPad or iPhone development will only work for um, Objective-C, which is a dialect of C, actually, which is what we're learning in this course. So for purposes of writing Objective-C code that works on a command line interface, that will work for you if that's your objective. Some of the other things that you may want to do is uh, the virtual, virtual box concept. All right, so I'm going to let this update run. It looks like, uh, looks like it may have run. When you find it, if you can't find it on the computer after you download it, and you can click on the find button, type in Xcode. It should be uh, in the applications folder. Drag it, stick it on your dock. If it's on your dock, Xcode, and you load it up, should look something very similar to this. A little window comes up. My version is 4.6.3. If you have an older version of Mac, which I just updated this this morning, so mine is 10.8.5. You probably have 10.8 point something, probably 4, maybe. Who knows if they change the version on it. Then if that's the case, then you can um, run your update and then uh, update Xcode. There's a new Xcode update out for iOS 7 that just came out this morning, or it must have just come out this morning or within the last week because I just got that update for it. Um, so while I'm talking, you can go ahead and uh, download your software <laughs> so we can multitask. Um, so now what I'm going to do is kind of go over lecture number one. For those people who came in late, behecker.com. In behecker.com, you'll see in here um, SCN 970. There's two sections of it. They're both the same. It's the same class being taught with uh, six, six weekends, actually. There's three for this class, three for the other class. What I'm going to do is on the PowerPoint lectures, we're going over lecture number one. So if you don't want to look at this screen, which actually is pretty clear today, <laughs> if you don't want to look at this one, that's one good thing about this room, the screen is clear. Um, then you can uh, look at this one on your own as a PowerPoint slide. So let me talk about Objective-C, give you a little orientation to the language, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So this one is called Objective-C. So in the meantime, uh, don't wait to download your uh, your stuff. Download it right now if you can. Um, I do understand that we have a little bit of problem with the internet activity, but uh, 
if you do have it installed, um, actually, good, good point. If you do have it installed, open it up, actually, open up Xcode, and uh, ins make sure you install the updates for it. So go into Xcode Preferences, and under the Preferences, you want to click on the Downloads tab, and install the command line tools. If you install, install the command line tools, then if you go to a terminal prompt, you get GCC. And for those people who know C, GCC is a GNU C compiler. So long story short, it works with Objective-C as well. So that's how it works on Linux, actually. So if you have Ubuntu Linux, you install Xcode onto Ubuntu Linux, install the command line tools, you can write Objective-C code. That is a better solution, maybe than the virtual box, depending upon what your preferences of operating systems are. Only problem is you can't do iOS development on that. But you can use a, the GCC compiler with that, which works just fine. There's also a ceiling that should also be supported, uh, which it is, actually. So let me show you uh, a few things about Objective-C. So we'll kind of switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more on the PowerPoint stuff. Unfortunately, that's really much all I can do for you today, especially in the morning. Oh, we're going to do attendance? Yes. Um, okay, so let me pause this. Sorry. All right, let's go start with Objective-C. So let's at least see what we're talking about. Some of you may understand the concepts even though you can't practice it. Uh, let's see, Objective-C and object-oriented programming. All right, so a little introduction here. You did enroll in a course that requires a MacBook because Objective-C is written for developing Mac applications. It's implemented as a set of extensions of the C language. So C++ is the Windows version. And I should say Windows version, but C++ is very popular with Visual Studio.net and C++ development. That's Windows. Objective-C is Mac. So it's the Mac equivalent to it. Comes in handy if you want to write iOS applications. Uh, so it's designed to give C a full capability of object orientation. It's also an object oriented language, just like C++ is. So it has slightly different syntax, same concepts. We're creating classes. Classes come in a set of two files. So in C++, we got a C++ and we got a .h. In Objective-C, we got a .m, which is the C++. And we got a dot .h, same thing, actually. One is the implementation, the other one is the interface. So I'll go through that today as well. Um, it has additions. Uh, in addition to C, it also takes from Smalltalk. So it has a Smalltalk dialect to it, which is why the syntax is very different. Uh, C++ is more C-like, actually. More, I shouldn't say C-like, because C++ has a different dialect to it as well. So some of you may have taken my object-oriented programming course in C++. If so, you'll notice there's a lot of similarities in terms of the object-oriented concepts. Not so many with the syntax. So you, what you want to do is kind of get familiar with the differences, so you can sort of see how that works. And we'll look at Hello World in a few minutes, and we'll kind of examine that. So Objective-C incorporates C, so you get the benefits of C, plus also you get the object-oriented part of it. So it's just another object-oriented version of C. And um, you define a new class. And uh, the class is the object. We make instances of objects in a driver program. And then we have the objects perform functionality. And so the objects have data members and member functions like they do in C++, and actually in Java. If you know Java, you know object orientation already because you can't program in Java in a non-object oriented fashion. It's 100% object oriented. So Objective-C is mostly dynamic where C++ is static, which is actually kind of interesting. C++ is a statically allocated language, which is why it works on Windows. You compile into an .exe file, and you run it, and the .exe file runs on the runtime environment on Windows, and you have to compile for every single runtime that you're working with. So you compile for Windows 8, Windows 7, Windows XP. Uh, you compile for Linux, Unix, if you're going to use it on the Unix system. You still have the same kind of concept, but this only works on one platform, so you don't have multiple compilations. So it can be integrated into the operating system during its runtime a little bit more uh, efficiently, and everything can be done dynamically as the program runs. So all of the memory allocation is dynamic. Everything runs dynamically, which makes for a faster, better running in terms of the runtime support versus a statically allocated 
kind of compilation and statically allocated running environment. So it does take advantage, it's a little bit more sophisticated, it does take advantage of dynamic memory, it's 100% dynamic language. Objective C is also a simple language. Uh, its syntax is small, unambiguous, and easy to learn, so they say. And uh, did it just get warm in here? No. Is the heater on? Sure. No, seriously, I think the heater got turned on. Actually, hold on one second. <laughs> All right, uh, sorry about that. Um, most decisions are made at runtime for Objective-C. Just know that it's a dynamic language. And I'll go through some of the dynamic nature of this language as well. Object-oriented programming. I'll start out with the object. As we mentioned before, the template of the object is the class. Same concept we get in a lot of other programming languages that work with an object-oriented uh, methodology. So the insight into the object, it combines the states and the behaviors. There's actually three components to every object. Actually, I can, talk, I can give you an incomplete summary of object orientation, not on the slide, but I can do it in like a couple paragraphs here, and I'll just tell you the big picture. For those people who haven't heard this yet, it's the same in Java, C++, Objective-C. Every single object-oriented language, the methodology is a pi. A space P-I-E. It's a pi. A stands for abstraction, P is polymorphism, I is inheritance, E is encapsulation. <laughs> so the object is the base of the methodology. Everything is related to the object. The object has three components to it, identity, state, and behavior. We give the objects an identity by giving it a name. This is a person object. We give it states, which are the data members, or the fields, or however you want to call them. If I were talking about a person object, the identity is a person. The states are how old is the person, or when was the person born, um, what color hair does the person have, uh, what's their ethnic background, I don't know. All the things that describe a person so that all objects would have the same states. So they're all common among all objects. Everybody has a hair color if you have hair. Everybody here has hair, so you have a hair color. <laughs> you have an eye color if you all have eyes, and most of you have eyes. <laughs> Uh, long story short, they're common among all objects. And then we have the behaviors, the behaviors and the methods, or the functions, if you want to call them functions. So the behaviors are what the objects do in their existence. So you sit and take a class. That's one of your behaviors. The so students are people. They eat, they drink, they sleep, they take classes, <laughs> they go to work, uh, they try to install Objective-C, they do a whole bunch of other stuff. So. Uh, which is really all we're talking about. We're taking a methodology that works with the concept of an object. The A in a pi is the object. That's the abstraction. of. And then also we have different forms of abstraction. We have process abstraction and data abstraction that goes along with object orientation. The data abstraction is the data structures, the queues, the stacks. The object itself is a data structure complex data structures, um, and data storage, the states. The control are the behaviors. And also part of control is the access control. So in terms of uh, is it pri private, public, protected? Is it, uh, are they, when can an object run? When can an object sit? Uh, when can an object do something as part of their behaviors? Um, so in terms of the control abstraction of the object, the P for polymorphism is the ability of an object to adapt. So if an object can be made with one parameter and it can be made with two parameters, and using a constructor as an example, or the object of a person can turn into a student, and then when you're not a student, you can turn into an employee. And when you're not an employee, maybe you can turn into a parent or something. All of those different morphs you know, the many hats you wear, it's polymorphism in the language. We build that as a co component. And then the I is for inheritance. So we inherit and we reuse objects. So everybody is inherited from object. It's the main object. In fact, it's very clear in Objective-C because we see that as the main object. And we have everything else below that is a sub-object. And so we specialize the behavior and the identity and the states of the objects as we go through and we inherit pre-existing conditions and pre-existing properties and methods and everything from the earlier stages. Um, so 
you know, we evolve our objects through inheritance, just like people have evolved through inheritance. We no longer have tails. We stand upright. Um, we're not, uh, you could follow the evolutionary track of humans. We've evolved through inheritance. Well, that's what objects are doing as well in your program. Creates for reuse. So we reuse functionality we already have. We don't have to reinvent the wheel of a person once we've created a person. So we have a whole repository of people and animals and dogs and cats and stuff, and we just make new instances of them after we created it. And then the E for encapsulation. Once we create the person, it's the person. You know, actually, if I were to talk about any person sitting in here, I don't know if I could describe you in eight hours. There's too many intricate little details. <laughs> if I look at your neurological system, your breathing system, your respiratory systems, all these subsystems that you have, all of the things, all of the memories that you have from the last 20 years or so alive. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. Instead of going through all that stuff, we just call you a person. You're a student, better yet. So long story short, we've encapsulated the concept as a student or as a person, just like we say a car. What kind of car do you have? Well, I have a radiator made by this company, and I have a transmission made by that company, and the brake system's made by that company, and I got fire some tires, and I got this, and I got that. No, I just have a car. So it's encapsulation makes it easier. So in encapsulation, they also call that information hiding. They hide the information. It's a person object. So in Objective C, when you start using the base classes to print something to the screen or to do something, we're just using pre-existing objects. Without even knowing Objective-C, if you're a C++ programmer, it's C in and C out. Actually, C and C out is actually, believe it or not, has everything in it. It's an abstraction. It's polymorphic. It has inheritance, and it has encapsulation. It's all of those concepts in it. So most of the components in object orientation have those components. And so if you were to describe object orientation, that's what we're talking about. So how is it related to object, Objective-C? Well, that's interesting it's different so the object long story short methods and instance variables that belong to the object so it's fully compatible with ANSI standard C actually um, and it's also you can be used as an extension Objective-C can also be used as an extension of C++ we could put C++ code inside of an Objective-C program it uses C++ it uses C uh, we want to learn in this class, we're not learning C++, we're learning Objective-C, but I'll show you actually, it does a lot of, you can just print F and scan F if you want it to, it actually supports, oh actually that's C, it's not even C++, but yeah. Uh, very often a new Objective-C programmers will resort to their C background and write syntax in C, just because they don't know how to do it any other way. So although C++ itself is object-oriented language, there are differences with dynamic binding, so remember, C++ and Objective-C are sort of at the same level. They're both object-oriented implementations of C, but they're done extremely differently. C++ is completely static. Objective-C is completely dynamic. And then people usually argue with me and they go, oh, no, 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 you can do some <coughs> dynamic stuff. You can use pointers in C++ and create dynamic behavior, yes. So, it has it, but it was a secondary thought to the language. The base running part, it's running in a static runtime. Windows uses a static runtime engine. So it's going to be statically bound, statically running. It might have some dynamic, but it's heap allocated or stack allocated dynamic behavior. <laughs> so it's still using a static, not 100% purely dynamic environment. So the advantage that Objective-C has is it's 100% purely dynamic. Most people are thinking, well, why do we care about that? We have a small little device called an iPhone or an iPad or something. Actually, a small little device, iPad mini, small. Not too much memory on that. We can make a system run faster by making better use of the memory, by dynamically allocating and dynamically deallocating automatically. So it makes bigger programs run on smaller hardware more efficiently, faster, better. So, which is what we get with... Uh, dynamic running Java on Android devices. Android is created with Java programming. Java is 100% dynamic. It's just the same way as Objective-C is 100% dynamic. So we can have something, uh, an instance of an object get created, and we can destroy it. It has automatic built-in garbage collector. 
C++, um, C++ has the garbage collector, has no automatic dynamic anything. It's all static. Very limited, unless you're going to do website development or you're going to do .NET development. No need to learn objective, uh, excuse me, C++ or Visual Studio .NET. So. I have a strange feeling because I'm seeing a lot of Windows computers out there. <laughs> you guys all come from the .NET, .NET craze. I am extremely anti-Microsoft and anti-Windows, so you're in the wrong class. <laughs> no pity for the Windows people. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Object to C. As I mentioned before, we got a .M and we got a .H. Let's just look at the .m, actually. Um, in the bhacker.com directory here under course materials, if you have a MacBook, now's the time we can start doing stuff. If you have a Windows machine, you can download the files, look at it, but you can't do anything with it. You're gonna need, you are going to need to get a Mac operating environment to take this course. And I know you just came in. And I've had you before in other classes. Do you have a Mac? Do you have access to a Mac? You're going to need access to a Mac. You know, you can buy them on Craigslist fairly easily. In fact, I would go for the MacBook Air, actually. It's not a bad deal right now. Four or five hundred bucks. Much better than using your Windows system for this. The class requires a MacBook computer. Or VirtualBox, running an ISO. These guys over here have been struggling with it. Um, so, actually, let's just do a quick search real quick here on, on Craigslist as an example. <laughs> In fact, you could probably get a MacBook. You want a Lion or Mountain Lion. Actually, Mountain Lion is what you want. You don't want Maverick. Maverick's too new anyway. Uh, so if I go to Craigslist, actually, let me just do this real quick here. And I look at this. Uh, go into uh, California. Let's see. Obviously, I've never gone to Craigslist on this computer. Uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Computers. Now, I'm not taking any responsibility for any bad deals or any bad product or any bad computers, but let me just show you what you want. MacBook Pro is good. MacBook Air is good. 2007-2008. You want to run uh, OS X 10.8 uh, something. Uh, so what do we got here? I uh, got everything else is not Mac. What did I do? Let's do this one. 13 inch is probably okay for you. So let's see. $300. A 15.4 MacBook Pro 2.2 dual. This is perfect. It's $300. <laughs> buy a used one. Actually, this is a perfect time to buy a used one because in another month we're gonna have the brand new Pro come out. This is the this is the I actually I got a super deal. This is a new computer. I got a super deal on this one that I'm using right now. Because the Mavericks with the the Maverick operating system with the Pro Retina, the newer version with the Haskell kernel is coming out in another month. So people are this people are getting rid of their MacBook Pros. You want a Pro because you want six eight gigs of RAM. Doesn't really matter how much hard disk you have. Actually, I have a couple of the Airs and the Airs have four gigs on them. They work just fine. With 128. So you want 128. Uh, okay. Xcode cannot be opened during installation. Oh, that's right. I forgot I had Xcode on. Um, this is in Mill Valley, though. So you want a two point, two point something or above uh, because it won't work on a less than a one gig, one gig processor. You can't install Mountain Lion on a less than a one gig. Um, I actually have, uh, real, real, actually, for the last class I taught, I had three MacBooks, sold them for $400 each. But they're sold. I don't have any more MacBooks. This is the last time I taught this class. Um, you can buy them three, four, five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars is a really nice system, you know. Actually, four hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, for the cost of a couple of textbooks. It's worth the investment. You can also go to Apple and get uh, uh, refurbished, refurbished ones for six six hundred, seven hundred dollars, maybe at the most, maybe less actually. Uh, it's not bad if you're a computer science. Now here's a MacBook Pro inch, new battery, nice fast for $400. So 
So the old pros are three to four hundred dollars. What you want? This is a pro. You want you want an old pro if you're gonna if you're going to uh, if you're gonna just use it for school. It'll, it'll come in handy as I mentioned before. You can do Python, PHP, web development, Objective C, C Java. It's a great all around programming tool. It's a great development system. You can do Android on it. In fact, it works better. Android works better on in, in MacBooks than it does on Windows machines. So if you're going to get into this development, you're going to want it. Um, if you have questions about, you saw here, here's a 13 inch Apple MacBook Pro, Emeryville. There's no price on this one. Here's $700 cash. This looks like a 2011. You can get by with a 2008, 2005, 2006. This one's 700 because it's an 11. Practically brand new. Looks like actually. Looks pretty good. So. <laughs> uh, it depends on how much money you want to spend on it. But uh, it's uh, they're all over the place. And they last forever. They're really good running machines. So uh, don't hesitate uh, to make an investment in that area. And you don't have to buy a textbook for this course. So there's $100 towards your computer purchase right there. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, so... Programming practice number one. So if you have a MacBook, download this, or if you have a Windows machine, download programming practice number one. If you do that, if you have internet connection, that is, and you double click on it to install it, you'll see there's a code one directory. I copied the code one directory into my terminal prompt. And I have it right there, so I'm gonna change directory to code one. And uh, if I look in here, I've got uh, hello, hello main, hello.main. So this is hello world. I'm going to show you hello world in a few minutes here. Actually, I don't need this. I'm going to throw this away. I'm confused where this is at. And we'll kind of see how Objective C is different from C. If um, I wanted to compile hello world, I can go GCC minus framework. And the framework is uh, foundation, actually. I have to add the foundation framework to it because I'm doing it with a GCC compiler, actually. And uh, I'm going to uh, compile hello.m and I'm going to say framework, no such thing. Let's see. Let me come back through here. Framework, I misspelled framework. Okay, no, I didn't misspell framework. Foundation. So if uh, GCC doesn't work for you, C Lang. So we got two. We have two. Mine is a 64-bit processor. If you're on a 64-bit processor, not a 32, GCC kind of gives you this framework. So see if I here, I'll show you what happens. If I take C Lang out and replace it with GCC, I'll get something that says something about my processor eventually. Oh, there's some syntax errors. It looks like it doesn't understand the stray at character and yada yada. But if I take and compile the same thing with C-Lang, it works. Did you have a question? I saw a hand go up. Oh, okay, you're just stretching. So what I'm typing in for you guys is showing you how you can compile this from a command prompt. If you take the Unix route or the Linux route, the Red Hat or whatever it is you're going to do, Ubuntu is actually a popular one. If you install Ubuntu and you install GCC, you can do this. You just can't do it on Windows, but you can go to a command terminal prompt in Ubuntu, type in CLang if you're on a 64-bit, or GCC if you're on a 32-bit processor. What we included was a framework called Foundation. Foundation gives us our libraries. I'm going to go through the history of this in a few minutes, but uh, sparing you the history right now. It's the Foundation Core Libraries for Coca and Coca Touch. Well. Coca, actually. Coca Touch is a different set of that. Coca Touch is the touch interface for the iOS. Coca is for OS X. So, uh, long story short, if I run this, because I didn't give it an output file name, I have an a.out. So if I run a.out, and for those people who have done uh, Linux programming or Unix programming before, you might expect that same result. Here it says dot forward slash a dot out runs the file. If I don't want to call an a dot out, I can go in here and say minus o, let's call this one hello. Let's go hello dot exe for Windows people, which is actually kind of funny. I used to teach a Unix class at a different school. 
And they compile, they, the students would compile programs, they put a .exe extension on the end of it, and I'm like, why do you do that? <laughs> That's Windows. That's not even Unix. And uh, this is BSD Unix, by the way, which is what you get on it. This is why it works on a MacBook. So it's Unix, BSD Unix. Objective-C is based on Unix. Actually, the language is based on a language that's based on Unix, which is C, which is Unix. Anyway, uh, long story short, now I have a file called hello, so I can go dot col, uh, forward slash to say it's current directory, hello. Oops, and uh, what's wrong here? No such file, hello. Let's see, did I get an error message? No, oh, I kind of called it hello.exe, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, hello.exe, there it goes, hello world. So what does this hello world look like? Well, it looks like this. So here's some source code. And this is a, this is a little program called Nano. It's a text editor. It's just easier because I'm in the terminal mode prompt window. It's like VI. So um, if you're not a Unix person, you're going to become one soon. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to use Xcode. So if you don't have Win if you have Windows, you're going to do this. You're going to install Ubuntu, X Xcode on Ubuntu, and do it with a command prompt because you're not going to get the GUI. It's not going to work. Uh, but you can do it this way. Through a or actually, you can use command prompt. I'll show you command prompt in a few minutes through Xcode. That works as well. Uh, but here's what it, uh, hello world looks like. This is hello world.m. Normally, if this were a class object, we would have a .h that goes along with that. So Objective-C uses import. Uh, just, you can actually use include in here, too. If you're including C++ classes, I could go like here and say include, or excuse me, C. I can say uh, include uh, IO stream. No, it's uh, STD, STDIO.h or something. If I wanted to, and then I can run printf and scanf inside of here. If I wanted to, if you're a C programmer, you know what that means. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, but the include is statically including. It's adding to the package the information that's associated with the functionality for IO stream or excuse me STDIO which is the functions in the libraries. Import says it's out there already dynamically link it. <laughs> it's doing the same thing but it's dynamically including it instead of statically including it. But you can make Objective-C run statically by using include. Actually you can include foundation uh, foundation.h if you wanted to. So I have a directory that's automatically installed when I installed the Xcode that gave me foundation. Foundation.x.h is kind of like um, IO stream and uh, STDIO, standard input output. It's the foundation. It's the console interface is what we're getting. Um, and then this might look familiar. It's integer main. So every program has a driver to it. It's in the driver's main. So integer main has a data type, as we've seen before. How many people have never taken a programming course before? You've never taken a program. So this is going to be way above your head, but you're only uh, one. I have less on it by myself. Oh, OK. Yeah, so stop me and ask questions. And I'm go Otherwise, I'm going to assume you've had a basic programming course before. We all know about data types. Um, everybody, except for you. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> no, so all right, we know that these are command line arguments that come in. Hopefully, just refresh your memory if it's been a while. This is the newest part that you may not be familiar with because we are dynamically running. We have this thing called an uh, auto, auto, well, auto release pool. Uh, not to say the whole part of it. So if we come around here, it says auto, oops, I have to arrow down here. I'm not in Windows. Auto release pool is what this is. What is it? We're going to create some memory. It's kind of like doing new. In, uh, but we still have, it's kind of like doing new actually in uh, C. We have this little at symbol here. This is a, what's called a compiler directive. It's used a lot in the language. It tells compiler, create an auto release pool for me. And we stuck the whole program inside of the auto release pool. What does that mean? Create some memory for me. Create some memory. How big? It doesn't really matter. It's just going gonna, gonna to dynamically size itself to what it needs to be. And then you insert some code in here. This is an NS log. So it's kind of like printf, actually. In fact, let's just see. I'm going to make a modification here. I'm going to say printf uh, again. 
In fact, I'm even going to do this here. Uh, actually, let's just leave it alone. Because uh, C, C syntax works inside of Objective C. If I save this thing, let's just chest this out real quick here. Uh, yes, compile it again. I'm going to take the exe off of this, though. I don't like the exe on there. Now if I run it, I see again it's down here because I didn't put a line read. I was going to put a line return in, but I didn't. <laughs> so, so now I see hello world, and then I see again at the bottom. So you see that printf actually worked in there. And it, it's actually part of foundation, which gives us name. If you're familiar with C++, you get this standard namespace thing. Maybe you've heard of or not. Foundation includes the standard namespace of C, C++, so which is IOStream and STD and all of the other ones. So um, I shouldn't say IOStream. You actually have to include IOStream if you're going to use C++. C is already in there. C++, you got to add support for it, which you're not going to want to do. If you're programming in Objective-C, you're going to program in Objective-C. You're going to program in C++, you program in C++. Don't try to mix the two languages. But C is used in both. There's people that write C code in C++ and also in Objective-C. Anyway, so... Uh, and then uh, at the end of this, we have our opening and closing bracket that gave us. And I'm going to show you different syntax in a few minutes where we don't use... We can use automatic reference counting and stuff like that as well. So this is just one of the examples. And then we have return zero just like C. So we can actually turn this into a C file real easily. We just take out this import on the top, change, take out the auto release pool opening and closing brackets, take out the NS log. NS log is a log. Okay, NS stands for next step. Next step is the foundation. It's part of the foundation library. It's part of the COCA interfaces. There's somebody at the door. No. Oh, was it a student? Yeah, it's like... Oh. <laughs> they can come in. <laughs> That's the problem with this classroom is you can't see anybody. I can't see anybody over there. <laughs> anyway, long story short, <laughs> we have... NS stands for next step. Log is the console log. So it's writing to the console log. And because we're using NS, we have this at directive. So you're going to get familiar with this by the end of today. But... Uh, the add directive says, print it to, tell the compiler that this is a string that we want and that this is a string. Which is weird because in the printf version, we didn't have to put the add directive in front of it. We just said print this out. So this is very Objective-C-like. And then the NS in front of everything is very Objective-C-like so as well. Uh, but yeah, we can turn this into a C program really easily by taking out the auto release pool and taking out the foundation, taking out the NS log. And then we got a C program. So you can hopefully see, and the purpose of showing you this was to kind of demonstrate the point that this is uh, a dialect of C. And it's very C-like in terms of its nature. So, All right. So we have um, a .m file, which is the similar to a .c++ or C file. And then we have the .h file, which is the interface that goes along with that. So in C++, we also have a .h file. In C++, excuse me, in C, the .h is an include file. And it's holding information that's being used, like structure definitions and functions and things that's included into the .c++, or .c file, I should say. In C++, the dot .h is a pre-compiled header. It's a slightly different concept between C and C++. It's the same concept in Objective-C as it is in C++. So if you don't know C++, don't worry about this. If you do, it's the same concept that you're supposed to be doing for each one of your objects. Your object has an interface and then it has an implementation. Objective-C as a language is strongly enforcing object orientation. C++ as a language is a loose interpretation. <laughs> Does not strongly support it. You can get by 
by not using a .h file in C++. You do that in, in Objective-C, compiler will complain your program's not going to run. So you have to have a .h, you have to have a .m for each one of your objects. Otherwise, your project isn't going to work correctly. I'm going to get into that in a few minutes, what goes into each one of them, as we start looking at the source code and stuff. So here's an example of main, and main has a list.h and a list.m as an example. This is a list object that has an interface and an implementation that goes along with it. So in C++, as I mentioned before, the reason why I keep going over this over again, because if you don't get the difference between static and dynamic, you're going to lose it completely. The whole thing doesn't make any sense to you until the light bulb comes on. It's a strongly typed language. C++ is extremely strongly typed because it's 100% statically allocated. <laughs> take programming language concepts course, take computer science one to understand what static means, but it's pre-configured. It's set at compile time. Nothing happens dynamically. Yes, I know, new and deletes and pointers can happen dynamically, but you still have typed pointers. It's a strongly typed language. Objective C is strongly typed with generic types. We have better support for polymorphism and object referencing in Objective-C than we have in C++. We have this thing called an ID. An ID is a generic object type. So the definition is a data type used for Objective-C to define a pointer of an object, a pointer to the object's data, sort of like the asterisk is used in C++, but in C++ we have a strongly typed asterisk, we say integer asterisk i. <laughs> Objective-C, we just say id. id could be a person, it could be an animal, a dog, a cat, a classroom, it could be anything, it's just id. So it's generic, it's not, it's not mixed to a type. It's a pointer to a data element we haven't defined yet, we haven't decided what it's going to be. So any type of object, as long as it's an object, can be used with the ID data type. So now we take, took, uh, and we have a, a lo looser type typing system. Not so, uh, not so strict, not strongly typed. Because now we have dynamic behavior. We don't know what it's going to be until the program runs. And when the program runs and the user selects this inventory item, we'll make sure that ID is pointing to this inventory item instead of that one over there. So. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so here's an uh, ID space and object. So we have this is the data type. Which is generic. So that's one of, the, and what I'm doing is I'm pointing out the new things about Objective C that are different than any other programming language you may have worked with. Nil is a reserved word for null objects. That's pretty. That's pretty standard. Some people say null. Some people say nil. <laughs> All right. So the ID data type has no information about the object. Doesn't know anything about it. Every object carries with it this is a relationship. So everything is an object. So if it's an instance of a particular object falls in a particular hierarchy, then it's part of the is a. That's the same as Java and C++. Same is a relationship. And the objects are thus dynamically typed at runtime. So whenever it needs to, the runtime system just finds out finds out what class it is. What, what, what kind of object are you? Gets the are you an instance of this object? Are you an instance of that object? Ask the object what it is and then run a method on the object, which gives us a more pure polymorphic behavior than it is in other language implementations. So it's, it's pretty interesting how that works. So messages. So this is the different, the most different part, I would almost say, between uh, objects in Objective-C and objects in C++. In C++, we have the dot notation. That's what the dot notation. If I have an object person and inside person I have name, I go person dot name. And that seems pretty clear. You can actually do the same thing in Objective C. It supports the dot notation. 
but to run Objective-C dynamic messages. The syntax is different. It looks like this, receiver message. This is, object, this is um, small talk syntax. So Objective-C uses more small talk syntax. C++ doesn't use any of it. So, and then the ID comes from small talk as well. So. so to get an object to do something, so if I had an object that was person, and the object had a method called sleep, I'd type in person space sleep. Right, send the sleep message to the person. If this was C++, I'd go per, my person, or excuse me, this would also be my person. The instance of the object, if I had person, I said person, equals a new person, you know, and have it referenced by a type called, uh, an ID maybe called my person. My person space sleep. In C++ that would be my person dot sleep with opening and closing brackets like a function call actually. Uh, which is different. So, and I'll show you some live examples of this in a few minutes. Uh, so that's a little different. So the receiver and object, the message is simply uh, the name of the method and then any arguments that might be passed to it as well. So here's some examples of some messages. For example, if the message tells the my rectangle object to perform its display method, which causes a rectangle to be displayed, we have my rectangle space display. This is what we do in Objective C. The C equivalent to that, this is C, my rectangle dot display. So we don't have this opening and closing bracket kind of thing, and we don't have a dot. So we take the dot out, and we have these opening and closing square brackets instead, which is interesting. So it's a different syntax. And then here's another one here where we have some parameters sent to it, and the parameters are used by a colon, and then we have a colon over here. So we have set origin colon. 30.0 space colon 50.0. So this is my rectangle set origin 30.0 comma 50.0. This is what the C++ equivalent would be. So, so then we have the uh, method set origin with the two colons here. It has two colons, one for each one of the parameters. So we'll see some more. You know, to look at PowerPoint, that's why I highly encouraged um, you guys to get your own development systems because the look at PowerPoint is different than actually writing it yourself. And for these six assignments for this course, you'll have to write the assignments yourself. So, if um, you want, you could probably get by with a Ubuntu system if that's the case. So, so polymorphism also supported in the language. So each object has a definition in its own method, but uh, has different classes that might actually use the same method. So you can have the same method name that has totally different meaning to it depending upon the object. So in C++, they call it overriding and overloading. It's the same thing. <laughs> the same concept in Objective-C. So we override, override and overload. Um, in C++, we have constructors. In Objective-C, we have initializers with user-defined constructors if we want them. We just create it. But we don't have constructor behavior, we have initializer behavior, which is small talk like instead of uh, C like. Um, and those constructors allow us, or the initializers allow us to create instances of objects using any number of parameters that we might have defined in the initializer. So the concept is the same, the syntax and the terminology is a bit different. So in the Two different objects can respond differently to the same message depending upon what message you send to it with an overloaded method. The same method, different implementation. Together with dynamic memory and dynamic binding, it permits you to write code that applies to any number of different types of objects. So for those of you who know Java, this is like the two-string method. So we have two-string that's part of all objects in that language. It's inherited from objects. You just overload it for each one of your objects. You have the two string it prints out the object information for the object. In C++, they have method they have operator overloading <laughs> that does that much harder in C++. Pretty easy in Java. C++, excuse me, Objective-C even easier. So, in a lot of ways, Objective-C is more Java-like than C++ because you have true object orientation. Because um, Java, 
is a true object-oriented language. Objective C is a truly object-oriented language. C++ is a makeshift wannabe object-oriented language. So you don't have the built-in functionality of polymorphic behavior in the object. So there's no such thing as a two-string or a print or and you'll find out, you'll see, you'll discover in the next, uh, well, next day or so here, you'll discover all sorts of built-in functionality that's really cool, that's very Java-like, actually. So, the more, uh, the more you know about different programming languages, the more you can help you understand new programming languages as well. So some people don't like all the comparisons between the different languages, and then some people really like it. So, I only use the comparisons in the beginning. And then eventually we'll just, I will leave out the comparisons. But uh, in the beginning, I, when I start learning a new language, I want to know, well, how is it different from this language? And what can I reuse? Because what you're really trying to do is figure out, I have to learn this new language. What can I reuse from my pre-existing knowledge of other languages to help me understand these new features? So this is one you can probably figure out. Uh, in uh, Objective-C, we actually have to specify where we're coming from. We are coming from NS object. And NS object is the root object. In Java, it's object. In C, we don't know because we never mentioned it. <laughs> but it technically it's object. But we have no idea because we never have to mention it. Java we have to mention mm, don't really have to mention it if we don't want to. C doesn't even exist as a feature. Objective C does. So we're coming from NS object. NS is the next step object for COCA. And I'm coming into next step later on. But uh, it's where this language and this platform actually came from. There was a company called Next Step, actually. And Next Step uh, was bought by, well, well, bought by Apple eventually further down the road. But uh, it's the history of how we ended up with the Mac operating system. <laughs> So everything's coming from NS. They kept the NS for next step in the terminology, and the foundation uh, framework comes from there too. So. Where they came out with Coca? How Coca came out by name? I have no idea. Coffee? Coca? I don't know. Maybe they're trying to be more Java-like. I don't know. So. I don't know where that came from. Somebody can Google it. Um, inheritance is cumulative. So if we have NS object down here, we have NS object in square. We have it in line. Excuse me, we have it in rectangle and shape and graphic all the way up. So just like any other programming language, it's a cumulative. So a square object has the methods and instance variables of a rectangle, a shape, a graphic, and also an NS object. And anything that was defined specifically for square. In terms of our inheritance, we have instance variables. And we have methods, and we had method overwriting. Yeah? How about multiple inheritance? Aha! Multiple inheritance. It's like, uh, it's like Java. It's not like C++. C, okay, so you bring, bring up an interesting point. C++ supports what's called multiple inheritance. Multiple inheritance is when you go, you know, come from this class, comma, that class, comma, that class, comma, that class. So you have multiple objects that are all being inherited into one object. Java Objective-C, single line inheritance. <laughs> but we have interfaces which and protocols, which we don't have in C++. See, C++ said, well, instead of there being a true interface or protocol or category, which is what we have in Objective-C, let's just have multiple objects that are all the same. Actually, C++ doesn't have a true abstract class. It doesn't have a true interface. All it has is the class. All it has is the one data structure of the object. So it has to support what's called multiple inheritance. And it leads to errors and makes the language unreliable. Because you could take a dog, a plane, a boat, and a car and inherit it all into this chair object. And be like, well, why do we have that functionality in a chair? Can the chair swim, you know? Uh, or, you know, float? Where in Java and Objective-C, follow a single line. One object comes from another object comes from another object. So this is, this is actually demonstrating the single line. But then we move functionality in in terms of interfaces. So the Java interface is supported. We have interfaces, that concept in Objective-C, through protocols, 
and through categories. So we have a couple of different ways depending upon how we want to do it. We can take uh, add functionality to the object to make it part of an object grouping to support. So it's kind of a it's kind of a gray area. It does support multiple inheritance, just like Java supports multiple inheritance. It just doesn't support it through inheritance. In Java, we extend and we implement. In Objective-C, we extend. Well, we don't use the word extend, but we inherit, we inherit, we inherit, and we add this to it, we add that to it, we add this to it. <laughs> we add a bunch of stuff to it, but we inherit through one object. One object is inherited from another object, from another object, and then we have all of the other items that we add to the packages, or to the components as well, and I want to use that word package, which is what we do in Java, which is true object orientation. C++, that's, that's garbage to take objects and use it multiple inheritance through the use of the object. You can't create an interface. You, you can't actually, I mean, it's really hard to actually create a class class level stuff in there and use it over and over again in multiple multiple projects. Um, and then it leads to um, unreliable programs. So if you were to take all three of these languages, C++, Java, and Objective-C, and compare them against reliability, support for object orientation, um, usability in terms of actually being able to implement OO concepts, I put Objective-C on the top of the list Java underneath it, C++ underneath that. And then you have C, which is not object-oriented, which is kind of the foundation of all three of those languages. And people go, what do you mean Java is three? If you, have you looked? If you look at Java syntax, it doesn't look like C. <laughs> yeah, it borrowed. Well, Java is a combination of C, C++ with a better object-oriented implementation that supports truly dynamic behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the history of all this, we had C. And then a long time when we had, oh, object orientation. Before we had C++, we had Smalltalk. Smalltalk is on a different line. Took for a little bit from C, but a totally different family tree. And then we had Java that kind of came out of the Smalltalk. And then we had Objective-C that came out of the Smalltalk kind of branch. And then from here, we have from C, we have C++. So C++, Objective-C, and Java are sort of all on the same level in terms of the history. Um, started, well, some of them had longer development time than others, but long story short, they're all dialects of C as a predecessor. They all borrowed from that language. C++ borrowed a lot from that language. <laughs> Objective-C borrowed a little from the language, but more so from small talk. Java took everything that was wrong with C++ built it better from scratch, followed the small talk. So if, if anything, Java's a better interpretation of object orientation than C++. So how long will C++ stay around? They're saying not so long. Because we now we have C sharp, which is a better C sharp is Java better interpretation <laughs> plus C. So it's a better C++. So how long, I mean, I don't, want, I don't know if you'd waste your time. It's a nice learning language. It's a nice foundational language. I don't know if you'd waste your time with C++. Um, I, I think right now it's probably better to learn Java or Objective-C, actually. Um, and I wouldn't learn Smalltalk. It's not really used that much anymore. It's used on server systems. You can install Smalltalk. There's a couple of different versions of it still being supported. Uh, it's not made in mainstream, it's not used for mainstream applications. The only, 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 only people that are using C++ right now are the .NET developers. You have to. Which is the problem with Windows, it's, it's not supported on multiple platforms. It's, if you're going to do .NET, you're stuck with C++. Unless you use ASP or you use Visual Basic or you use one of the Visual Studio packages. So that's why you can't program on a Windows machine in Objective-C. It's not going to be supported. They're only going to support their languages. How long is that last going to last? Well, we don't know. Actually, it's lasted a lot longer than I thought it would by now. So <laughs> um, That's excellent. Actually, you know, if anyone does have questions, just to interrupt me, because I never take a break for questions. <laughs> you, have to, you have to break me in order to do that. So. All right, so right now what I want to do is see if my... Uh, Xcode got completely installed. Well, doesn't really matter. I'm going to minimize this a little bit. 
in the uh, code one file that we downloaded, I showed you uh, hello.m. In here, we also have a couple of other things. I have a student.h and a student.m. I want to show you this using Xcode, however. And I will uh, demonstrate basically creating a Hello World project. So if you've got Xcode loaded and you're ready to go, if not, just watch. And hopefully you'll be able to do this once you get your development system configured. Um, so if you've got Xcode loaded, I don't know, mine was updating. Oh, look at this. So mine did update. So Xcode and iOS development. Oh, it looks like it installed correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and agree. Hopefully. Oh. No, now I'm going to finish my install, it looks like. <laughs> so when you open up Xcode, it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't take too long. Um, I'm going to give you kind of a brief tour right now, show you the ins and outs of it. And then I'll load up that student in the .m, because who wants to use a command console? You know, we have Windows. This is a form of Windows. You know, we have GUI. You know, everyone likes GUI. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a different interface. Uh, okay, so this is a different interface than I had earlier today. Uh, so you can create a new... So when you get Xcode, if you have the older version, which is actually I'm kind of glad now that I did update it, because if you're installing it fresh right now, you're going to get this. If you don't have this, you have a slightly different look. It's the same screen. It's just been redesigned. So you have like a whole list of projects over here, and it's kind of split differently. Actually, and this is pretty nice because it had a bunch of stuff I never used, a bunch of links to the Apple developer sites. So what we want to do is create a new Xcode project instead of check out an existing project. Oh, interesting. So we're going to create a new Xcode project. This is the same. <laughs> so this screen looks familiar. Uh, we have different project types, although the graphics look better. Um, Right now, we're just going to select if you're doing this. Uh, if you're not, you're going to watch this. Video. This is being recorded, by the way. So you say, oh, I don't have a Mac computer, and you go on Craigslist or something. Actually, eBay's got some good deals, too. You buy a three or $400 Mac computer. You go, OK, now I need to catch up. Watch the video. So you can go back and look at this. So you can do this, because you need to do this in order to learn how to use the X Xcode interface. And I see some people do have some Macs, so it's good. Single view application. We're going to create Hello World, by the way. And I'm going to go next. And then you see over here on the left-hand side, we have two options. We have an iOS, or we have a Mac OS X. So actually, actually, let me do a command line. I'm going to do a command line program, actually, right now instead. Um, so we see a framework, library, application plugins, system plugins. As we go through the course, I'll explain more along the lines of what those options are for right now. If you're following along with this video or if you're following along live, go into the OS X category, click on application. We want to make a command line tool because what I want to do now is I don't want to use the terminal prompt anymore. I want to use the GUI. So I'm going to go ahead and select next. And I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call this um, my first project. So my first project, or actually, let me take out the my first project. How's that? That way I can keep track of which one is which. And um, under organizational name, you could put your name or your company name. I put ITU on there. Under the current identifier, this is your package path if you're a C++ person or if you're a, uh, excuse me, a Java person. I usually just put uh, ITU.edu on there. So put the website address, the company that you're working at if you're doing it that way. So under C where it says type, as I mentioned before, we can use C, C++, you already get this. So if you're on a Ubuntu system, these are the same options. You can actually do this on a Ubuntu system. So for those people who are, I know you showed up. I'm going to pick on you already with a Windows machine. Yeah. You have Ubuntu or Linux, Unix? No. Now well, see me at the break. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to do core foundation, or we can do foundation. It doesn't really matter. I'm actually going to select foundation down here on the bottom. Foundation is going to give me, remember before I said import found framework or foundation, foundation.h, because we're just going to use the same thing. So foundation is really what we're going to do. Why they didn't put objective C in there? I don't know. We got core foundation or we got foundation. We're really, they're both sub, this is a sub package of this one. This is a bigger package. This is going to have everything in it. So rather, this has core and foundation all in one. So I'm just going to pick foundation. And then I'm going to click on next. And then I'm going to save it um, to my desktop. 
I put it on the desktop so I can just throw it away when I'm done with this weekend. So, and you'd be like, you're going to throw it away? Yeah, I don't want to keep Hello World for the rest of my life. <sighs> so, all right. So in the uh, main project, I clicked on main.m. So remember that hello dot m we just looked at at the DOS prompt? <laughs> Looks kind of similar, doesn't it? We got import foundation, foundation dot x, uh, dot h, main. All right, if you haven't noticed, it's the identical program. It's identical. So if I run it in here, I'm coming up over here to the left-hand side. I see this little arrow up here. The arrow is still there on the old interface. This is going to be fun because this is a brand new interface. Uh, this interface has changed significantly <laughs> since last night when I looked at it, when I was updating my system. This must have just come out this morning. All right, so if you click on this little arrow down here, I'm expecting a console screen to show up down here. So let's see what happens. So I click on the little arrow, then it says build successfully, and then down here on the bottom I get my little console screen. So it says, uh, hello world, program ended exit code zero. Because I returned zero, <laughs> and that was the exit code. So this is a little bit easier than the command line prompt. It's doing the same thing. So we're going to use this now instead of the command line prompt. So you don't have to worry about CLang or GCC. If um, you don't have actually let me just check to see if this is still the same. Wow, it's different. During lunch break, I'll have to update my system. Uh, looks like I have maybe, well, I don't think I have iOS 7 on here yet. But this is the command line tools here that appear to be installed, perhaps. I'm not sure, but the interface looks the same. So. Actually, I showed you this a few minutes ago earlier in the, before I updated it. I updated it in between one of our little breaks, and the interface looked different. So looks a little sleeker. Um, over here you see the project type. It's on a Mac 64-bit, so I don't have to worry about CLang versus GCC. I can actually just run it right here from here. So, All right, so I'm thinking to myself, well, what do I want to do with this now? This just doesn't really make too much, you know. It's, it's kind of kind of, you know, kind of basic, right? So let's take a look here. And in code one, I have this student, and I have student.h, and I have student.m. I'm going to show you a little trick. You might uh, uh, want to do this yourself if you don't want to retype anything. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to drag it in. Actually, I'll put it on the bottom. I'm going to drag this guy in. I'm going to stick it in my first project. And it's going to give me some options here. I want to, do I want to create groups of added folder? No, I don't want to do that. I just want to copy the item into the destinated group folder. So I'm going to copy it in. So I'm not going to pull it from the original source, which is in another folder. I'm just going to copy it into this folder. And uh, do I want to uh, create folder reference? Uh, create my so just collect this one on top. Leave this one, create groups of added folders. Create folder references, no. I'm going to leave it on the default on the top one and press finish. And see so now I have student in here. So I got a student. And then now I'm going to take this student.m and I'm going to load student.m in here too by clicking uh, here, but just doing the same thing as before. Add to target. Yeah, that's not, I didn't have it, I didn't have that one selected, but anyway. And I believe I have a I believe I have a main that goes along with this one, and I think the main is right here. So I'm going to double click on my main. If I double click on my main, you see it opens it up in a separate window. And it's not part of this project here. I have a separate main that's still in here. I still have Hello World. And if I double click on it, it ended up over here. If you double click, it opens up a new window. If you click it once, it changes it, puts it in the center here. So if I click on it once, now I see it over here. I want to leave this one up because I want to write, write the code and show you how this is working. So if I run it, I'm still going to get the same behavior as before. I just added that object. I haven't done anything with that object. So let's take a look at this object because this is all about learning Objective-C. So we'll take a look. So we have, and as I mentioned before, let me a few lines down here. We have this thing called the interface. So this is your syntax. For creating an object is start with the .h file. 
If you're doing this in C++, you do it the same way. You're supposed to do it the same way, although a lot of people put everything all in one file, because you can. If you're doing it properly, we have an at interface, and the interface is going to be called student, and we use a colon to say that uh, we're coming from NS object, the inheritance is coming from NS object. And then we have an opening and we have a closing bracket. And inside of the opening and closing bracket, I have two data members in there. Most people who look at this, they go, what? Where, where did, how come you didn't put this stuff inside of the opening and closing bracket? Assuming that this stuff is methods. Well, in true object orientation, and from a small talk perspective, inherited into an Objective-C perspective, only the data really belongs to the method. Excuse me, only the data really belongs to the object. These methods are just things that we're going to do to this object. The data is being held by the object. The visibility is still with inside of the object because every object has an at interface and an at end. And we put everything in between the at interface and the at end to define the interface. And then when we do the implementation, we're going to have something very similar to that. We're going to have this at implementation at end at the bottom. So we put the data inside of the interface. Same thing we do in C++ actually. We define the data. That's the only thing that goes in between the opening and closing curly brackets. These are method prototypes. And you're looking at that going, method prototype. Well, that doesn't look like any method I'm familiar with. So let me just take this first one, print, and write the C++ equivalent for you, <laughs> which I'm going to get some error messages. If I were to write this in C++, I start out with a data type, and I go void, print, and then I got an opening. Actually, if it's a method prototype, it looks like that. I just put the semicolon at the end. It's called method, the, or excuse me, I can put the opening and closing. I have to remember C++ right now. <laughs> have the opening and the closing brackets. And actually, you look at this and you go, well, what happened? The error message went away. Remember what I told you before? You can write C++ and you can write C code inside of Objective-C. So that's actually legal. But we don't want to write, I don't want to write a C interface. I want to write an Objective-C interface. So let's take a look at this. Objective-C is symbol oriented. Remember the at symbol tells the compiler this is an interface. It's a compiler directive. Well this is saying that this method is an instance method. So the minus says it's an instance method. Most of the time you're going to use a minus sign. You leave out the minus sign, you got a problem. If I leave it out, I'm going to have a little red thing that's going to come up. Well, a little red thing. There, there's a little red thing. Hover my mouse over the little red thing. Oops, click on the little red thing. <laughs> it says method type specifier must start with a minus or a plus. Bummer. So I'm going to have to put the minus back. If I don't, I can make it a class method. Remember class methods versus instance methods? You're the only one that's not going to understand that because I'm pointing at you. <laughs> You're the only one that said you didn't have a programming background. <laughs> so, we have both. We can stick them inside. A class method is a method that's run by the class itself. The minus or the instance is by method that's run on instances of those objects that are created of that class. There's a book I want you to get, a Deedle and Deedle book. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm Googling it right now. If this is the first programming course you have ever taken, then there's another book you might want to get that might be helpful. The, guy, the authors are Deedle and Deedle. I'm going to go to Google real quick here. Deedle and Deedle. How to program in Objective-C. <laughs> C programming, uh, uh, Objective-C resource, Deedle and Associates, let's see. Objective-C programming, well, you can probably get this, you can probably get this book for free. I'm not seeing it on here. 
Deedle and Deedle are the authors that make really good C, C++, Objective-C, of Java books. They're, they're good because they're like really slow paced and they're a lot of pictures <laughs> and a lot of examples. Not so much reading. It doesn't read like a textbook. It reads like more like a fun kind of book. Um, the Objective-C, he makes a book, I think it's called How to Program in Objective-C. It's not coming up right now, but uh, or C, C, Objective-C Tutorials, uh, these I'm getting on the developer's site, looks like, or the Deedle and Deedle support website. Anyway, look up Deedle, D-E-I-T-E-L, and Deedle. It's a father and son combo. They write these textbooks that are, it's, it's kind of a, it's what I call like the best kept secret of programming books. It's kind of like, um, you know, in the beginning when they had the, the, the For Dummies series, the Deedle and Deedle books are sort of like the For Dummies, but they're not so dummy. They're actually pretty good. <laughs> so a lot of schools, undergraduate schools, actually use them for beginning programming uh, textbooks because they're really uh, made for people who have no computer science background at all. So not to say that you don't. You probably do have some. And uh, you, I don't know, something to explore. Because I'm going to talk about stuff. I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to assume you know what a method prototype is. And it's like, what's a prototype? Yeah. That's a method prototype. In Objective-C, that's a method prototype in C++. If we were to write the implementation of it, it sort of looks very similar. Let me take this out, actually, because we're not going to do C++ anymore. Yes? So, uh, if you would make that uh, method class type, uh, it's running dynamically, how are you going to do this? Is it something like static in uh, Java or in Java? Yes, very similar to the keyword static in Java, and very similar, well, it's the same concept in C++. You call it from a class level by using it like a function instead of calling it from a method. So it's not a message you're sending to the object. We're going to see that actually none, probably not until the second weekend. We might, actually, we might see it tomorrow. We'll see what happens. But uh, you could just call the method differently because you're not calling it from an instance. You usually you're not going to stick class methods inside of an object. You're going to stick it in a, what's called a protocol. A protocol is a bunch of rules, like putting a two-string method in there, putting something, um, I don't know, a print, something in there that any object can use. You just add the protocol to the, to the object, and it has these methods that are defined, and the methods are run on the objects. So, and the methods are part of the object implementation even though you didn't have to impl implement it. It's pre-implementing and adding functionality to an existing object. If you write a category, you stick a bunch of classes, class level methods in there. And you use the category sort of like a non-object oriented thing where you're just calling this as functions versus as methods or messages. So you're not really calling messages, but you can use them in a message kind of format. Long story short, in most of your object implementations, they're going to be instance methods. So you're going to want to use the minus sign. We have an entire lecture on class methods. So probably not till maybe tomorrow, if not the first day of the next weekend that we meet. So. so we have three prototypes here. And as I mentioned before, if we were to write this one in C++, this one would look like void set undergrads opening integer undergrads because we put the opening and the closing brackets in C++ so this is C++ and look at that the comments are the same and look at that they show up in green <laughs> so there's a lot of similarities with C++ in terms of the commenting um, that's C++, this is Objective-C. We go, well, what's the difference? Well, we have the minus. We have no, there's no opening and closing brackets like those in Objective-C. They took them out, nothing like that. So instead we have a minus sign to say that this, I mean, we have it, we have it for here, but we don't have it for here. The parameter list does not use opening and closing brackets. It's fine, not to, say, not to confuse you. We have the opening and closing. The symbol is a valid symbol but it's not used for the parameter list. The parameter list uses colons instead. The data types appear with the opening and closing brackets. So here we have void 
opening and closing bracket. This is the data type. If I wanted to, this is where the ID would come into place. I can use ID in there, which means it's not a void, it's not an integer, it's not a float, it's not a double. It's just ID. It's generic. Uh, but let's keep it at void. If I make this one void, and then the name of the method is the name of the method, and then the colon, if I have more than one parameter, I just put another space in here, put another colon in here, put another data type in here, put another method. Well, what do I want to call this other parameter? Another one. <laughs> and another. Now I have two. So we have a, the syntax is a colon. This colon here ended up right next to the name. We don't actually have to do that if you want to. So you can write it like that. That's confusing. I think that's easier, especially when you only have one. All the data types go in the opening and closing brackets. This is the name of parameter one. This is the name of parameter two. But we only have one parameter for here, so I'm going to take this guy out. So kind of the same. If you kind of study the differences, they're kind of the same. The syntax is probably the hardest thing to get used to because it's different. Um, but um, I'll just leave this one in here. And I'll take it out. So this one down here is the same thing. It's just a postgrad. So we have the set undergrad, set postgrads, and we have two integers in here. If I look at the .m file that goes along with this one, I see the implementations now. And I can make this a little bit. There we go. Get rid of that. We don't need that. So look at that. I got an include student.h. Very C++ like. <laughs> Actually, it's very C like, is what it is. Uh, and then we have an at implementation, and we're implementing student. So if we look at them side by side, uh, here I can look at them side by side by doing this. The at interface, the at implementation, the student is what we're implementing. And now we have the method bodies to look at. So the method bodies, this is going to look familiar. This is going to look just like C++, um, except for what did this do for me? I don't know. I think I just took out something. <laughs> Undo typing. Oh, new feature. <laughs> wow, I don't like that. There's a new feature, it looks like. It wasn't in the previous version of Xcode. So there's a lot of new stuff I get to discover this weekend. Uh, you can uh, hide and show the method body. Well, I want to show you the method body, which is the reason we're bringing this up. Uh, so here it is. We have the opening and we have the closing bracket. And in here, this is, very, this is C. This is C code. Integer total students is equal to the number M students plus number of uh, undergraduates plus the graduate students. So the student is keeping track of number of students or something. I don't know. It's really stupid. And then NS log, as I mentioned before, we saw that already with the Hello World. NS log prints something to the console. Could have been just as well, could have been, you know, printf or something. Um, at symbol, because we're looking at, and this is a opening and closing. This is a, an opening and closing bracket. So it's kind of a it's a, it's a function call in a slog. Um, and so we have total number of students is going to be, and this might look familiar. In fact, I can take this whole thing out, take take this guy out and take the at directive out. I can rewrite him like this, actually. Let's just do this. Oops. And he works. <laughs> Oops. Actually, maybe it looks better up there like that. Similar syntax, except for on the ns log, it's an ns, which means we have to use a compiler directive. So the at symbol is used in here. But this is the same. Same syntax is what we see with the printf. Familiar with printf? Get the needle and needle book. Standard IO. Really, once you learn this syntax, you got everything else. You don't really need to learn everything related to C or C++, or Objective-C for that matter. So you have the opening and you have closing brackets, and um, we have the implementation, and we have the same thing here. And this is the same, same thing as C++. We take the, the prototype, and we just add, instead of this, 
this is the prototype. And then you can actually do this. This is the implementation of the prototype. <laughs> you take the semicolon away, and then you put the opening and closing bracket, and you fill it in. This is going to complain because we have two of the same name in here. So let's get rid of this guy. So now we have one of the same name. So then we have everything between the at implementation and the at end. And we have, again, we're still using the minus symbol. You just have to get used to this minus symbol that's going to appear at the beginning. And the fact that we have an opening and closing bracket next to the data type. So, All right, so now if we take a look at uh, the program, let's just make sure we're still working. Yeah, we are still working. So this is a, an object in two files, the student.m and the student.h. And the driver program is main.m. And in main.m, we're going to make an instance of the object and use the object inside. So it follows through with the same concept that we get with Java and C++. We have a driver program, which is main. These other ones don't have main in them. This is for brand new people to programming in general or object orientation. If we put a main in here, we wouldn't really have an object oriented program. We'd have an object with a main, which is what people do in C++ all the time. And it's like, well, are you really making instances of objects and using stuff and importing packages and all this? And no, I'm not doing anything. It's all in one file. <laughs> so you want to break it out into multiple files. If you don't break it out, you're going to get an error message in Objective C. So this is weird. Anyway, uh, so main. If we look at the main that came with it, we see the syntax. And the syntax is going to look interesting. In fact, the reason why I didn't want to actually put this in here is I want to show you in here a little bit easier. In fact, if we take away, uh, I'm going to see what happens actually if I take away the auto release pool. Now we'll just leave the auto release pool underneath the uh, auto release pool. Hmm, let's put it on the top. I'm going to experiment here because what we have right now is uh, we have automatic reference counting versus manual reference counting versus maybe they took it out. Uh, earlier today, when we created the project, we would have had to say whether or not we were using reference counting or not. Did anyone notice that feature on there? I didn't notice it actually in the project. They took away a lot of the project properties. So I want to say that they took out the reference counting completely, which means it's all automatic now which might be an interesting concept, but I'm going to experiment a little bit here. Instead, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm actually going to copy this and put it in here and see what the error messages are going to be. And the error messages are going to tell me using an undefined identifier, iOS students. Now, well, we're going to have a problem. Student, student, pointer. Let's take a look here. Put it inside of the auto release pool. I might have to experiment with this a little bit at lunch to see what they did with the settings. They may have changed the defaults on me. And identify, well, this is better. Student, well, let's save the project. A little bit better. We got student. We got students. I'm going to experiment a little bit at lunchtime to see what they've changed with the reference counting. In the old days, I was able to turn on and off the automatic reference counting. Um, we're having a, we're going to have a memory thing going on here, I believe. Um, the other thing I could possibly do is just let me just check real quick here. Well, I'm not going to have to play with this at lunchtime. And I'm seeing that it is uh, 11.54, which means we're almost approaching lunchtime. So we can take lunch, and then I can see what they changed in this newer version. This is a brand new interface for me. It looks different than the, the previous version does. Um, and people can spend the lunch hour actually uh, uh, updating their systems and getting things ready as well. So let's take... Um, here, let me stop this video. Um, I'm going to continue this after lunch. So if you've got this started, leave it up. Just save it. Uh, don't take it down. Um, I'm going to leave this intact so I can pick up. And what I want to do is kind of figure out 
what, how the project properties have changed. Um, and what do you think about an hour and a half? You think? Is that good? So if it is, uh, let's call it noon right now. Here, let me stop this video, actually. <laughs>